So when I was taken away that day when I was six years old, it was it was frightening to be sure. I didn't really know what was happening. It's just, you know, I was eating some key lime yo plate, if I remember, just like in my favorite pajamas, like with my brother, and then all of a sudden it's like beating down the door with a ginormous hammer. It's like, open up. And my parents started going crazy. I was terrified. I didn't know what was going on. Um, my, my mom took all of us into one room, just like to not witness what was happening. And my dad tried to deal with, um, biological father tried to deal with what was happening at the door. And then eventually they like, broke down the door. We were all in the room. I saw what happened. Like it was like very violent, the way they like pushed my dad to the floor, he broke his nose, all of that. So I was just terrified. I didn't know what was going on. Um, and then after that, was just a police officer started talking to me and he's like, go get a change of clothes. So I had to go to another room and change and it was so awkward. Like the police officer just standing there while I was changing and I was like, okay. <laughs> and I got to take one, like one extra thing with me of clothing. And after that, they just put us in a car and we were like, where are we going? I asked, where are we going? And it was like, just to another family. And I was like, okay. <laughs> Didn't really understand what was going on, but I don't think, I think I was too afraid to even want to process. It was, it was a lot. Since I don't have my own children, I can't compel. So every child who comes to my home, I treat them as my own child, even if it was one day, for three days, for a year, for a whole life. And I can't imagine having your own child at home misbehaving or you know, having some problems, you just call on yourself, social self, say, okay, take this child away. I can't take care of it. It doesn't sound right to me. So no matter what happened, and trust me, I had my own stories and shares, especially with teenagers, uh, that you're like, oh my God, how you can deal with that? You know, drugs, sex, pregnancies, hallucinations, you can name it. There's a lot of things. And then, with patient and understanding that this child has no place to go, because that's how I see it, they have no place to go. There was a specific court date for my brother's adoption. They were deciding whether it would be detrimental or not for my brothers to lose contact with me. In order to figure that out, I was assigned a visit with them I think maybe an hour long that was monitored and the monitor wrote down the interactions that we had. It was unfair in my opinion because how could you determine a person's relationship, their siblings based off one hour that they're together, especially when in the past you only got to see that person once a month. How can that person have much of a relationship with their sibling due to the current, current circumstances. And then after that monitored visit, visit, we came back into the courtroom and my brothers were all sitting at the table facing the judge. They called people up to ask questions to my uh, brothers and to myself to further determine whether it'd be detrimental or not to lose contact. Some of the questions were <laughs> stupid in my opinion, asking like an eight-year-old boy whether he would rather rather watch TV or hang out with his sister, whether he would play video games or hang out with his sister, would you rather go to the park or hang out with your sister? In many of these cases, my younger brothers said, I'd rather play video games. I'd rather go to the park. I'd rather watch TV. So by those answers, is when they determined that I was more of a friend than a sister and that them being adopted, it's fine. It wouldn't be detrimental to anybody's health. You can trust every person that comes to your life. I would not agree with that ever. I teach my little kids the same skill too. I said not every person that smiles to you is your friend. Not every adult person that you meet necessarily knows better than you. And all of these skills needs to be taught, especially to the kids in the situation like foster care. And I think other kids too, 
do not trust easy. Some people who you're going to trust need to earn this trust somehow. They need to prove that they really should be trusted. And it works both ways. So for you to be trusted by others, you should prove yourself. And I think it's very good skills for life these kids need to have when they grow up. Again, for the most part, most of the houses I lived in from six to eight were very all over the place. Some were good, some were bad. I think in a general sense, um, just, it was an overview. Again, it's like some of my, my first foster family, they were really nice. It was like this couple, young couple, had a dog. I was the only kid there. They were very kind, they were really accepting, they were really trying to do something, make the world a better place, I suppose. And then other foster homes where you saw things like neglect, being treated as an outcast, sexual assault, things like that. With my brother Shof and my brother Elijah, they were living together before Shof began to live with the family I'm with now. And um, there were obvious cases of like malnourishment and neglect. They, my little brother, when he started living here, from what my mom has told me, is very obviously malnourished, had bruises everywhere, had really weird allergies to things. And so we could only imagine that Elijah had gone through the same thing. I mean, it sucks to see a family member like that even though I didn't have too much of a relationship with him and I was hearing these things secondhand at that time, just hearing the stories of like how he looked and how red his face was and how many bruises he had and how tiny he was and how he could barely even talk even though he'd, you know, been a couple years old already. It was really, really hard to hear. And so when I first started moving here, when I first started living here, sorry, um, I put a lot of effort into building a connection with him and letting him know that, like, I'm your sister, I love you, I'm here, this family is good for you. That's not going to happen anymore. The, the, like, not, like, those words that I said, but just, like, in an overall sense, being there for him, becoming very close to him and being, like, a safe space for him. I don't have an idea where any of my siblings are currently. Again, with the closed adoption, no phone numbers, no addresses. If they, they, last time I knew they all lived in SoCal, but who knows, who knows now? They could be in like another country for all I know. Um, basically, all I know about them is their birth names and their birthdays. <laughs> That's about it. <laughs> Cause I'm pretty sure a lot of them changed their names. I couldn't even look them up if I tried. I do hope I get to see them one day. It's probably the main thing that I pray for. It's to be able to see them again. And even if I wouldn't be able to see them again, I do have, I hope that they at least think of me and remember me and even if it's just the smallest memory, just have like some knowledge they do have an older sister out there. And if they ever do care to look for me, that I would love to have a relationship with them. My progression of like what I wanted to do over time was, right? Like when I was little, I wanted to be a social worker. And then I realized social work was a terrible job. And then I was like, oh, I want to be an attorney. And I was like, no, ter ter attorneys are terrible. And then I was like, oh, I want to be a judge. And I'm like, judges are terrible. And now I'm like, oh, I want to work legislatively and work on the law. Maybe I'll have a further realization, laws are terrible. Abolish the government. I, I don't think I'll get that, you know, I hope yet. not, but, yeah. Uh, maybe. Possible. Possible, maybe I'll become an anarchist. Mm -hmm. I see it happening. Um, well, can I say I'll support that too? You'll I support might it too? I might disagree, but I support I it. I think Papa would agree with me. Uh, maybe a little bit. I think conflicts are happening every day almost every hour, you know, and some people feel very bad about it. I, I don't, <laughs> uh, because I do believe that the kids need to see you 
being angry, being frustrated, being mad, talking about it too. And I had very nice conversation with my nine years old boy right now who asked me about six months ago uh, the very tricky question. He sat in a chair next to me and said, you know what? I need to know if you will be very happy if I'll do everything you ask me, if I will be good boy all the time, if I'll do only things that I allow to do, right? And I said, no, I would not like that. And he was shocked. He said, why? But you ask me to do these things, and so you're supposed to be happy when I do them. And then I had to explain to him that him doing things the way he wants, arguing with me and misbehaving, being mischievous and loud and annoying, is basically his way to stand his ground. One of my biggest desires is not only to foster and potentially adopt youth in my future, because I, I really want to do that. I would um, foster and adopt if necessary, kind of like what happened in my mom's situation where she fostered me and then there's a possibility to adopt and she adopted. I would do the same thing. If a kid needs a permanent parent, I would love to do that. Um, so yes, I would love to foster, I would love to adopt, and um, my career goals are consisting of working legislatively with, within the foster system and hopefully fix it, I don't know. <laughs> Just enjoy your life, live every day the way it is, don't try to plan something that you have no control over because when you have no control over it and it's not happening you try to plan or count on it you will be disappointed so much less disappointments if you just don't plan things that over your control i'm going to college right now so that i can learn the laws and start from the root of the system and you know study see what's wrong, see what I can do, so that when I go to law school and then on, just to the best of my ability, fix what I can. Um, really, they just, when you look, they look at the data system to see who can take in a foster kid, like within the area, within the current county that we're in, for example, Los Angeles County right here, they just see open home, how many spaces do they have, that's it and then the occasion, like, see if they can put siblings together. But it doesn't tell you anything about, like, what the family is like, what kind of family it is, what religious, what religion they're practicing, whatever, any dietary restrictions that the kid may have. None of that is looked into, and it's something that should be looked into. I couldn't say that I have a love for this place or a hate for this place. There's really no feeling whatsoever. It's somewhere where I spent a lot of my time. Decisions were made, some good, some bad. Coming back here now, it's, it's interesting to be back. It's very familiar, nothing's changed. But I'm not feeling any, any negative sort of way. It's more just of a Honestly, kind of a refreshing feeling, knowing that my case is done and over with and I won't, have, I won't be having to come here anymore. I would love to come back if it were in a different context for what I want to do with my future. If I came back here in a position, instead of being the one that decisions are being made for, the one that's making the decisions, that would be great. <laughs>